That is an incredibly kind and gracious introduction. And for those of you that know Pastor Jackie, you're not surprised by the kindness and the graciousness of her words. Um, and I will say that uh, she is not wrong. The most important part of that entire CV and anything else that I may have ever done in my life um, is the fact that I now have a 10 and a half month old grandchild um, because that has made all the difference uh, for all the things um, in my life. Um, it is an honor to be here with you uh, today. Um, we will start. So today's text is Esther chapter 4, verses 9 through 17. I'm going to start with a couple of uh, how did we get here kind of things. Um, first of all, things you may know but are worth repeating. Esther is the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God. For this reason, its canonicity was contested for quite some time. That and the questionable Persian sexual ethics that we'll hear a little bit about as we move forward. But largely, it's the apparent absence of God. Esther is also only one of two books um, in, the, in the scriptures that are named for a female character, Esther and Ruth. And I would point out that at least in my opinion, Esther, unlike Ruth, actually fails the Bechtel test. For those of you that know or don't know, the Bechtel test is pretty simple. The Bechtel test requires that two women have a conversation with one another about something other than men. <laughs> Esther fails this test. Failing the Bechdel test, at least when we're thinking of film, uh, raises questions about whether or not any female character in the film, in the story, in the plotline is actually a character in their own right with their own sense of agency, their own developed person, or are they simply a character prop for the men in the story? I'm not really going to answer that question, but I just want you to know that that's the question that failing the Bechdel test does raise. Esther also only shows up once in the Revised Common Lectionary, and it's not the text today that we're looking at today that is in the Revised Common Lectionary. It's from chapter 7, not chapter 4. And I assume that what this means is even though that this is a room full of very intelligent, very gifted scripture scholars, you probably haven't necessarily spent a whole lot of time with this text because you wouldn't have had a reason to preach it unless you're using the narrative lectionary. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, narrative lectionary. We need the whole stories, and so that is what we've missed. So a little bit of background, assuming that you may know it but may not, um, is that Esther is a quasi-historical story or uh, book. It isn't, it's more like historical fiction than it is history in any proper sense. There is lots of hyperbole. There are lots of ironic reversals. Um, in a, many scholars re describe it as, as funny. I sometimes don't really see it as as funny as, as maybe. It's a, it's a very gory graphic funny, but if gore is funny to you, there is, there is some humor in it. Um, that doesn't tend to, to be my, my humor. Uh, most scholars date the writing of Esther to about 80 years after it's reported to have taken place. And so, of course, we all know that that means that there's going to be a lot lost in translation. Uh, the setting is about 100 years after the Babylonian Empire, or the exile. Some of the Jews had returned to Israel. Think Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, sorry, that's Spanish, not English. Some did not. Mordecai and Esther are among those still in Babylon, which is now Persia. Esther is the story about the Jewish community that is living in Susa, which is at the time the Persian Empire capital. And King Ahasuerus is also known as Xerxes I, who is the son of King Darius. And if you are a 90s child or the parent of the 90s child, you may remember Veggie Tales, right? The, oh no, what we gonna do? The king likes Daniel more than me and you. All right, so this is the king's, this, sorry, that's terrible, but this is that king's son. So we have a history of, of this king and his lineage being pretty rough on Israel. So to catch us up to date with just to the text today, um, it's a long four chapters prior to today's text. So what happens in short is that King Ahasuerus hosts a massive party and he gets sloppy drunk. He then invites his queen, Queen Vashti, to show off to his equally drunk friends. She refuses, he is very unamused, she is banished. After some period of time, the king decides that maybe having a queen was a pretty cool thing, and he wants one back. 
And so his court suggests an empire-wide search for a new queen. The king agrees. All the eligible virgins are brought into his harem. And this is not a Veggie Tales beauty contest. This is modern day human trafficking. Esther is one of the women brought into this harem. Her cousin and her guardian, she is an orphan, Mordecai warns her not to reveal to anyone that she is Jewish. After a year of preparation, Esther is taken to the king for a night and chosen by him to be his queen. Again, think not beauty contest, think human trafficking. Meanwhile, Mordecai learns of a plot to kill the king, tells Esther and saves the king's life. And later, the king promotes Haman, who is an Agite, which is a Canaanite. In other words, he's someone that the Jews had been previously ordered to kill all of, and they did not kill, King Saul did not kill um, Agog, and so now Haman is an Agite. Uh, to the position of vizier, and Haman decrees that everyone will bow down to him. Mordecai refuses. Haman, now unamused, just like the king, decides to kill all of the Jews in Persia. Mordecai learns of this plot, comes to Esther, and asks her to intercede on behalf of the Jewish people. And that is where today's text picks up. So I'm going to read the text for today, and I invite you to close your eyes and try to envision the scene. Hathak, one of the eunuchs, went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself have not been called to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time... Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's family, you will perish. Who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Okay, open your eyes. Now that maybe you've not just heard but envisioned this scene. What image or word or phrase stands out to you? And I invite you to take literally 30 seconds, but share with neighbors. What stood out to you? And I realize it's hard to give a 30-second warning when I said we were only going to talk for 30 seconds. So um, uh, pull that back together. There is so much in this scene that is pivotal. Everything that follows, their survival of the Jews, the ironic and gory death of Haman, everything depends upon this scene. Up until now, Esther has been relatively passive. Her life has been what has happened to her. And she has primarily done what she's been told to do, primarily by the male characters in her life. But here, she becomes her own agent. She is very matter of fact. I have no idea where this comes from, but something deep inside of Esther gives her the space, the strength, the agency, the power. She suddenly finds her voice. 
and with her voice she has a plan. Verse 11 is the first time that we hear Esther speak directly for herself. Now, of course, for such a time as this is one of the most often quoted passages and sort of what we're going to focus on today. But let's start again with a little bit of conversation around your table, focusing just on these two verses. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. One of the things when I use scripture passages with my classes, I'm a theologian, not a scripture scholar, so when I use these types of passages with my students, I always ask them to ask, is there anything in this passage that is unsettling to you? Is there anything in this that doesn't rhyme with the theology that you bring to it? What is that? Because whatever it is that might not be rhyming with what you already think you know, you probably want to unpack a little bit more. So I ask you to do that now, again, at your tables. Just take a minute and answer that question. Is there anything that stands out to you as being a little bit unsettling? Anything you're not sure you like? Something that doesn't sit right with you? I'll give you just a minute for that at your tables. All right, and I know that that doesn't give you all enough time, but let's, uh, I want to be mindful of the time. A lot of commentators have focused on Esther's courage, but a surprising number of commentators have actually minimized the role of Esther in general and of Esther's courage and have focused more on Mordecai. These commentators also probably don't think I should be standing here leading a Bible study. Um, <laughs> And I would recommend holy mischief to them, actually. But many folks have also hyper-sentimentalized this passage. They've Disneyized it, right? It becomes a rags-to-riches sort of a story, sort of like the musical version of Oliver. You know, where, and you should never let great musical theater get in the way of a really bad and tired plot line. But, but there's a problem with over-hyper-sentimentalizing this passage. And so I want us to focus one of the words, one of the parts of this that always kind of sticks with me when I read it is the word perhaps. So let's focus on the word perhaps. Perhaps, maybe, possibly, it is conceivable. For all one knows, it is not outside the realm of the possible. There is some chance. Perhaps means we really do not know. This isn't a statement of faith, I don't think. It is more of a shot in the dark something one might hold on to when there isn't much of a chance of getting out of this mess alive. Maybe not unlike Tom Hanks, holding on to Wilson and building a raft in the movie Castaways. Perhaps. I'm gonna shift for just a second and see if you know what this is. This is a rock carn. Um, I've worked a lot with young adults on vocation, and we often use the word vo uh, discernment when we think about vocation, and discernment's a great word. Um, but I also like to use this image, because sometimes discernment actually doesn't help an 18-year-old. Um, this is an image of a rock carn from Acadia National Park in Maine. My husband and I, four summers ago, hiked Acadia. We hiked 35 miles, I think, in about three days. Um, and it was amazing and it was beautiful. I'm from North Carolina, and this only matters, well, for a lot of reasons, thanks for the woohoo, but um, it matters because when you hike in North Carolina, you have trees. And you have a lot of trees, and on the trees, there's usually like colored things, right? So you follow the blue trail, or you follow the red trail, or you follow the green trail, and then you don't get lost. And you don't, in theory, die while you're hiking. And this is a wonderful thing about the trees. In Acadia, there aren't trees, you're climbing a rock. And so there's nowhere to post blue trail, green trail, yellow trail, or don't go here, or you're going to die trail, right? Like it doesn't have that for you. So what it has are these rock carns and signs asking visitors not to, uh, not to build another one and not to touch these, right? 
And what they, how they work is if you can see in the picture, the rock carn is rock standing on top of one another with another one going through it. And you can kind of see through the middle. And on top of that is a narrow long rock that points. And it points the direction of where you're gonna go next. And so the rock carn becomes a signpost. It tells you where to go next. The point is that when you're hiking, you usually can see tops, three rock carns at any given point in time. The one you're actually standing at, the one you left however many hundreds of feet behind, and the one that's coming up next. You never get the full view. There's no road map, there's no GPS, there's no Colonel Mustard in the billiard room with a, must oh, with a candlestick. There's just a suggestion that perhaps this way is the next best step. And that you can go just a little bit further this way because going backwards is the only other choice you have. And though at a park like Acadia, going backwards is a fine choice, we all know sometimes in life going back isn't an option. So focusing on the perhaps of Esther reminds us that this outcome was not predetermined. It could have been otherwise. Esther could have been banished, she could have been killed, all the Jews in Persia could have been slaughtered. Esther had no way of knowing that things were going to end out the way that they did. She could not see the road in front of her. She only knew that turning back or pretending that things were less horrible than they were were no longer live options. Now, those of you that know me well know I absolutely adore Sam Wells. Sam Wells and his work on Esther suggests that a key theme in Esther is that the Jews have to create their own salvation. This resonates with me um, just enough that it worries me a little bit. In part because it potentially reinforces the seeming absence of God in Esther, and it can also reinforce the very uncharitable Christian claims about Judaism as a religion of works righteousness. But I think it also bothers me because when I think of vocation, I always think of it as something that we're discovering in movement toward. It's always as we're stepping into or moving toward. There's a Spanish poet, Antonio Machado, who has a poem where he writes, Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Traveler, there is no road. The road is made by walking. Now maybe, theologically, I would want to say that the road is more discovered than it is made. But Machado's image is helpful to me. Esther discovered a path that is full of ironic reversals of power. Esther discovers a path in which she is exalted as queen and her people are not only saved, but all who had threatened them were destroyed. She discovered this path because there was absolutely no freaking way she could have seen it coming. So let's go back to the question of what you might have found unsettling in this story. What bothers me is literally everything. <laughs> this story hinges on the one person with the least power. Esther is an orphan, she is a woman, she is a religious and an ethnic minority in a misogynistic and anti-Semitic world. She is the poster child of intersectionality. This story raises all sorts of questions of justice and intersectionality. And shoot, forget justice, Esther just needs survival. And how often is this true for people in the margins? She was functioning on the most base level of the hierarchy of needs. Esther is often praised for her courage, and I don't want to take away from that because she was hella courageous, but sometimes we culturally praise an attribute in order to reinforce it. I've been listening to a podcast series that I recommend called La Brega. It's about Puerto Rico. One of the uh, podcasts talks about the frequency with which the word resilience is used to describe Puerto Ricans, particularly in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And again, I wouldn't want to do anything or say anything that takes away from that reality. But y'all, they're resilient because they had to be. They're resilient because they were abandoned. 
there's a resilience that's there and that's real and I don't want to do anything or say anything to take away from it. But what bothers me with texts like this is when we lift up courage or we lift up resiliency and we praise it rather than addressing the need for it. So my question as I read Esther's text today is who are the Esthers in our world who need to be courageous precisely because they sit at the intersectionality of justice and security are just not for you? And how do we keep from turning, perhaps you were born for such a time as this, into an excuse for leaving Esther in the world on their own, albeit brilliant, but to their own devices? Or to borrow shamelessly, shamelessly from Bishop McKenzie the other night, we are cordially invited to imagine a world in which the courage of Esther is not necessary because the well-being of Esther is no longer threatened. I've noticed, maybe some of my North Carolina colleagues have as well, some relatively new billboards along the interstate where I live, at least in the Hickory and Asheville area. Each of them show a picture of a small child, different children, but a small child. And then they have in large print, be brave, report child abuse and neglect. Yes, adults, be brave report child abuse and neglect, but holy cow, how much more courage does that child have? Be brave, we're called to defend our LGBTQIA siblings, but realize how much more courage they have to inhabit the spaces they inhabit. Be brave and stand up for our immigrant siblings and honor the courage that they have had to have in order to leave home behind. Be brave and reject white supremacy and patriarchy, but do so remembering how much more courage the generations of people of color and women that have come before us have had to learn. Be brave as we allow the Holy Spirit to rekindle the gift that is in us that cordially invites us to live into the resurrection promise. And then we hold on, we come back to the perhaps. We go out not knowing. I love this prayer. I'm sure we all know it and love it from our hymnal. Oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we go out not looking just to praise the courage of Esther or the resilience of the marginalized, but to ask the question, what time have we been born into and what role do we play in changing the circumstances that require such courage? Thank you. <laughs>